During Season 15, Season of the Lost, I started playing Behemoth, and it has been my all-time favorite subclass ever since. During that season, I created a build that in my opinion is by far the strongest build in Destiny 2. Despite the new things that were introduced since Season of the Lost, the build has never left my inventory, nor did I think any other builds will replace it. Now with the introduction of 3.0 subclasses, more variants of the build have arisen, but none are able to surpass the power of Behemoth. And of course, I'm talking about the Behemoth the Stronghold combo. The build is heavily focused on resistance, turning you into a literal tank. You can get a whopping 97% damage resistance that makes you pretty much unkillable, and strong burst damage that allows you to annihilate non-boss targets with a good ammo economy. You can effectively run zero recovery stat with the setup, build up a fortress by yourself blocking all incoming damage, get an unlimited 35% damage buff to your swords, have built-in anti-barrier champion without the help of anti-barrier mods or exotics. And best of all, you do not need to kill any enemies to trigger any effects of this build, and all of these are without the help of artifact mods. One last thing before I get started, don't skip over an entire section of the video. I'll have explanations on some niche things that you might find useful, and they are part of the build in actual gameplay, and should be something you incorporate into your own gameplay. And without further ado, let's get started. Starting with combat style mods, there are four that are necessary. Elemental Charge, Elemental Shards, Super Charge, and Lucent Blade. Elemental Charge allows you to become charged with life whenever you pick up an Elemental Well. If you pick up a Well that matches your subclass type, you gain two stacks of Charge with life. Elemental Shards turn Stasis Shards into Stasis Wells for you, which allows you to gain two stacks of Charge with life when the Stasis Shard is picked up. Super Charge increases the max stacks of Charge with life to 4 from 2. Lucent Blade allows Swords to deal 35% more damage when you charge with life, but doing damage with a sword when charged with life will get a buff called Keen for 6 seconds. During that 6 second time window, the sword damage is increased by 35%. The last combat stat mod is totally up to you, but I recommend you use Stacks on Stacks. You'll gain an extra stack of Charge with Life whenever you become Charge with Life, and with proper aspects and fragments, you will almost always have a stack of Charge with Life to activate Lucent Blade, and never run out of Stacks or Charge with Life. Let's talk about other mods you should have for this build. On the helmet, put on double sword scavengers to increase the amount of heavy ammo drops. On the gauntlet, it will most likely be anti-champion mods, but if it's not necessary to have anti-champion mods in the activity that you're playing in, use grenade kickstarts to gain some grenade energy after using one. On the chest, put on the concussive dampener and the melee damage resistance. If you didn't know, melee damage resistance grants you resistance to damage that's in melee range rather than actual melee attacks. As it states in the mod description, reduces incoming damage from combatants that are at point-blank range. For example, if a sniper is attacking you in melee range with a sniper, melee damage resistance will provide the damage reduction and sniper damage resistance won't. Because you will be up and close with enemies, melee resist will benefit you a lot. Concussive Dampener is used because a lot of damage in this game are area of effect, which Concussive Dampener will help in reducing that damage. On the leg, put on the Sword Scavenger for more ammo per brick pickup. Finally, on the class item, use double utility kickstart to get barricade energy when it's used. With two utility kickstarts, you'll get the barricade back in about 12 seconds, meaning that you'll always have at least one barricade on the field. If you decide to play defensively, the barricade has you covered. Taking this into Grandmasters, in the Exodus Crash boss fight for example, you can have all three players stay in this little corner while you drop down barricades to block incoming damage. Anything other than the boss that passes through the barricade will be blinded, making them very easy to deal with. You can effectively deal with all of the incoming enemies and the boss by yourself, while the other two teammates having only to deal with the shanks. In the tank room of the pooping grounds, arguably the most difficult part of the nightfall, you can draw barricades after barricades to block incoming damage and prevent anyone from being annihilated by the tanks or interceptors. I do not have actual GM footage of me doing these in these two nightfalls, but just take my word for it. Now, let's talk about abilities, fragments, and aspects. For the class ability, go with Towering Barricade. It's basically an on-demand cover that you have all the time. For the movement ability, it can either be Strafe or Catapult Lift. Pick whichever you think best fits you. There's only one melee ability, so we have no other choices. This won't be used much anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. For the grenade, go with Glacial Grenade. It creates a wall of stasis crystals, which can be used for blocking damage, and synergize with aspects and fragments. For the aspects, use Tectonic Harvest and Diamond Lands. Tectonic Harvest spawns the stasis shard when the stasis crystal is shattered by you. Remember the more elemental shards? When you pick up a stasis shard by shattering a stasis crystal, Crystal, you gain 4 stacks of Charge of Light instantly, which means that you'll never run out of Charge of Light for Lucent Blade. Diamond Lance allows you to create these Stasis Lances when you kill an enemy with Stasis Shatter or Stasis Abilities. Despite the description not mentioning Stasis Weapons, you can actually create Stasis Lances by killing enemies with Stasis Weapons. 
Here is an extra tip regarding diamond lands. If your finisher is neutral, meaning that the kill effect changes color depending on your subclass, such as the gladiator's blade rush and security's breach. Finisher kills will also create stasis lances because these neutral finishers will take on the element of your subclass. If you're using stasis, they will count as stasis kills, creating lances. You won't be using Diamond Lands as much as Technotic Harvest, but Diamond Lands will allow you to absolutely immobilize non-boss targets. Stasis Freeze is about 5 seconds in PvE. Although the cooldown of Diamond Lands is 8 seconds, there is a small window of time where the enemy is in the recovering state after breaking out of Stasis Freeze. We can practically keep the enemy frozen forever if we're able to properly manage the timing. The trick is to start your attack animation a second or two before the enemy is about to break out of stasis, and throw the stasis lands right after the enemy is ready to move away. For the fragments, you will want Whisper of Shards, Chains, Rhyme, Conduction, and Torment. Whisper of Shards will boost your grenade recharge rate when you shatter a stasis crystal, which will be your grenade. Each crystal you shatter will grant you 5 seconds of improved ability regeneration, up to 10 seconds. Because Glacier Grenade generates 5 crystals, you can gain up to 25 seconds of improved ability regeneration. If you space out shattering each crystal, you will always have at least one crystal on the field, which you can take advantage of that with Whisper of Shards. It grants a 40% damage reduction when near a frozen enemy or a stasis crystal in an 8 meter radius. Whisper of Run grants a small amount of health when a stasis shard is picked up. When you are at full health, you get some overshields that stays for 10 seconds. This will be one of the ways to heal yourself. When enemies are chasing you down and you are at low health, throw down a glacier grenade, it will freeze the enemies in front of you, buying you time to heal. Block enemies at range so you don't get killed out of nowhere. And you can break them with a barricade to get the stasis shards to heal you, instantly pinning you back into combat. Whisper of Conduction will allow stasis shards to track to you, saving you time from running around the battlefield just to collect stasis shards. Lastly, Whisper of Torment. You gain grenade energy whenever you take damage from targets. Since you'll be engaging enemies more often than not, this will help you in getting grenades back so you can stay engaged for longer. Sometimes you'll purposely take more damage just trying to get the grenade back, like the play capture in a glassway nightfall. Glacier grenade and barricades will set up a fortress for you, and you will want to get as much grenades as possible to maintain the fortress and damage resistance so you don't have to step off of the play, making this part of the nightfall quicker. Now, let's talk about the super. Glacial Quick is a tier 2 super, meaning that it has the second slowest recharge time in the game. This is not something you will actively use or try to use. It serves as a tool for large AoE control and damage output covering an entire area. The damage from Stasis Crystal Shatter is quite good, but the crystals from Glacial Quick spread out so much, it's not practical to match the damage up without the help of a bubble from Edge of Action or a huge boss like Riven. Common situations where you will be using the super are killing large groups of enemies with a couple high health targets like champions, killing or doing damage to bosses or high health targets like Goliath tanks and controlling large groups of enemies buying time for your teammates to disengage. Stats probably don't need much explanations. Mobility generally isn't useful on Titan. Strength is not useful for this build. Intellect can be nice, but the super won't be used much. Or if you really want to have a quick super charge time, substitute stacks on stacks for Font of Wisdom. The two stats you should prioritize for is Resilience and Discipline. Resilience ties to your barricade recharge time and damage reduction up to 40% DR at max resilience. High discipline allows you to use the grenade more, which is a very important part of the build. High recovery definitely is nice, but you'll want to get comfortable with the healing mechanic of Stronghold, which I'll talk about that later. For starters, have as much recovery as possible without sacrificing resilience. Once you get comfortable with this build, you will want to use enemy attacks in the grenade to heal you, as opposed to passively regenerate your health. Moving on to weapons, for master and below content, I recommend Wayfair Grenade Launcher, a special ammo kinetic weapon of your choice, and the Lament. The absolute best Wayfair NGO that you can get currently is the Forbearance, which drops from the Vow of the Disciple Raid. When using Stronghold, primary weapons typically aren't needed unless it's for anti-champion mods. For Grandmasters, have a Blinding Grenade Launcher instead of a Wayframe. Or if you don't need any anti-champion primary weapons, use a Blinding Geo in the kinetic slot. If you're new to Stronghold, a Blinding Grenade Launcher is highly recommended for Legend difficulty and up. Blinding Grenade suppresses enemies, usually minor and major enemies, in a 10 meter radius for about 5 seconds. It's extremely potent in high-end PvE as it stops enemies from attacking you, allowing you to focus on the more threatening targets, or high health targets like champions. The only other perk you'll need on a Blinding Geo is Auto Loading Holster. By shooting a blinding nade shot, it suppresses enemies nearby, buying you time to kill the threatening target with the men. Once killed, you can swap back to the grenade launcher, shoot it a second time to suppress the enemies again, allowing you to escape. 
I think it's worth giving swords a section on their own. Swords currently aren't sought after weapons like linears or rockets because they're extremely high risk without the proper reward to compensate for the risks that you're taking high in PvE, and they can't dish out enough DPS in damage phases. Oftentimes, for most people, swords will only be used on single targets. They have really good ammo economy and should be used on minor enemies more often with the proper build. Currently, at Seasonal Seraph, there are only two swords that are viable in in-game PvE, the Lament and Crown Splitter. Let's talk about the Lament first. You can get the Lament with the Beyond Life expansion. It's arguably the best sword in the game ever since its release. It has tireless blade so you can use it on ads without worrying too much about the ammo economy. The trait Rev Consumption heals you when you damage combatant with a weapon. The intrinsic trait allows you to rev the sword by holding down your guard button. You will go into this chainsaw-like attack where it shreds through enemies and break barrier champion's barrier. Each attack will grant you a stack of Banshee's Whale buff. Each stack increases the sword's rev heavy attack damage up to a max of 9 stacks. A common lament attacking pattern that I see is that 3 rev attacks are needed before you do the final heavy attack to get the best damage. That would be true if the weapon works like how we think it is. The damage numbers are weird, so let's break it down. Starting with Rev Light Attacks, each attack has three parts. The first two numbers are constant, meaning that they remain the same across all stacks of Banshee's Whale, while the third damage number is increased by 33.3% after one Rev Light Attack. Even though Banshee's Whale only is supposed to increase the heavy attack's damage based on the weapon's description, Banshee's Whale buff works as the following. You will start with Banshee's Whale times 1 with your guard. Each individual damage number from Rev Light Attacks increases the buff stack by 1. Because the Rev Attacks have three damage numbers, each rev attack gives you 3 stacks of Banshee's Whale. After the first rev light attack, the buff stacks are 4. After the second, the buff stacks are 7. If we go into a heavy attack right now, the first two numbers will bring up the stacks to 9, which will buff the final number of the rev heavy attack to the max. Because each stack of Banshee's Will increases all 3 damage numbers of the final rev heavy attack, we need a total of 9 stacks before we go into a heavy attack, right? Wrong. The final number of the rev heavy attack after 3 light attacks is actually less than 2 rev light attacks. Because of that, the 2 light 1 heavy attack pattern does more total damage despite the first 2 numbers of the heavy attack being less. The difference is barely noticeable, but that's going to affect how you should repeat the combo in sustained damage situations. Which leads me to my next point, the best lament combo currently in the game. Currently, the best lament combo is 2 rev light attacks into 1 rev heavy attack, followed up by 2 regular light attacks, then repeat the combo to have the best sustained DPS. The reason for this is that 2 rev light attacks into a heavy is the quickest, while the final heavy attack having a higher damage than doing 3 rev light attacks like I mentioned before. Doing the 2 normal light attacks after the heavy attack serve as the purpose of recovering the sword energy. Because how the lament animation works, we can start guarding immediately after the second normal light attack, which means that we do not have any downtime in not doing any damage, and that will maximize the total damage in DPS. You could make an argument for only using one normal light attack after the rev heavy, but because of Lament's inconsistencies, sometimes you're unable to use two rev light attacks with only one normal light attack after the rev heavy, which can happen at the beginning of the season for example, or if you get sent to the air by a boss stomp, one normal light attack would not be enough to recover enough sword energy. You can definitely go with one normal light attack for the best DPS possible, but really the difference isn't extremely noticeable. You may know by now, you will often be sent to the air when using the Lament, while Airborne, you actually do less damage with the Lament. Unlike ground attacks, the Rev Light Attack numbers are consistent across all stacks of Banshee's Whale, but are about 20% less than ground attacks. The final heavy attack damage is the same for both. An attack pattern of 3 Rev Light into 1 Rev Heavy on the ground is about 15% higher than we are Airborne. Of course, that's the combo you use for sustained damage scenarios, but what about burst damage situations? The Lament is a really powerful weapon to quickly burn down champions in nightfalls and beefy targets in all activities. Let's talk about champion management. Because you will always have Lucent Blade ready, no matter what difficulty the champion is at, you can burn it down with just a single combo. Going from the hardest to easiest, in Grandmaster, 6 Rev Light into 1 Rev Heavy will bring the champion down to finish a range. In Master difficulty, 1 Rev Light into 1 Rev Heavy follow up by 2 normal light attacks. In Legend, 1 Rev Light into 1 Rev Heavy follow up by 1 normal light attack will bring the champion down into finish a range. In Hero, 1 Rev Light into 1 Rev Heavy will bring the champion down into finish range. That's assuming there is nothing else that will change the weapon damage like acute burns, you are max light level, all damage connects, and the champion is at full health. In situations where your damage is higher because of acute burns or the champion is not at full health, reduce the number of red light attacks or switch to 
do red light attacks only. If you underlie, add in more red light attacks or more normal light attacks after the red heavy if necessary. These will change depending on how much more or less damage that you're doing, and it will come down to experience. But a golden rule to remember is that if you think the champion is going to die after the heavy attack, don't use it. Just keep going with light attacks. To approach a champion with a lament, you should have a glacier grenade ready in case something happens. For overloads and unstoppables, stun them before you move up. Use whatever combo is necessary to kill them. If you miss the heavy attack, throw down the glacier grenade to freeze them. Stun and do the combo again. For anti-barriers, throw the glacier grenade or a stasis lance to freeze them before moving up. If you didn't miss, one combo will be enough. But in a case where you have missed the heavy attack, start guarding and eat the champion's next attack. After the barrier is up, start your combo and kill the champion. Of course, do not stand still waiting for the champion's attack if there are other enemies hitting you. You may be wondering, why bring the champion to finish your range and not just kill the champion? You will be relying on heavy ammo a lot with this build. Side note, don't be conservative with your ammo when you don't have to. Be the mighty titan and use those heavy ammo to destroy everything. When a champion is at finisher range, you can have a teammate come up with Aeon Gauntlets to generate heavy ammo for you. Currently in Season of the Seraph, the artifact mod Loose and Finisher will spawn heavy ammo for you when you finish the champion. This is not required, but is something that you should take advantage of this season. In the case that you don't need to finish the champion, adding one extra red light attack will kill the champion in most situations other than Grandmasters. In that case, just use a finisher. Another tip regarding the Lament is that the Rev Light Attack swing distance is the furthest among all swords excluding Eager Edge. If you're in a bad spot, use that to advantage. If enemies are in your way, look up to reduce the likelihood of the sword tracking onto them. The Lament is absolutely amazing for aggressive plays, but Crown Splitter takes the crown for defensive plays. With Stronghold, guarding with Crown Splitter grants you a 90% damage reduction, whereas Lament only gives about 80%, with no other damage reductions. I'll go in depth about resistance later when I talk about Stronghold. With Crown Splitter, your job is to get aggro for your team and use the insane damage resistance to your advantage. With Crown Splitter, you'll become the Titan of all Titans. You are the definition of a tank. You shouldn't play a crown splitter like the Lament, but you can incorporate part of Lament's playstyle to be a little more aggressive. You will never be able to play as passive as a ranged weapon unless you never use your sword, which you shouldn't do. Approaching champions with crown splitter is similar to the Lament, but because you don't have anti-barrier built in, the way you deal with the champions are a little different. For barrier champions, freeze them first with your glacier grenade. Heavy attack. This breaks all stasis crystals and deals a big chunk of damage to the champion. Pick up the stasis lands that spawned after you shatter the frozen champion. Freeze again. If you're not able to secure the kill with the next heavy attack, wait until the cooldown of diamond lands is over. Shatter the champion with the heavy attack and freeze again. The next heavy attack after this one should be enough to secure the kill. If not, repeat the process. For overloads and unstoppables, stun them before you move up. If you can't kill them before they recover from the stun, freeze them with a grenade, stun them again and go for the kill. One thing you have to get comfortable with is jumping before heavy attack. This will prevent you from slamming the enemy or the ground behind the champion. If you're looking to use the ground splitter, here are my perk recommendations. Although the blade choice doesn't typically matter, you should find one that balances impact and ammo capacity, which I will go for honed edge or tempered edge. On the third column, go with Relentless Strike or Tireless Blade to help with ammo economy. On the fourth column, go with Warful Weapon for that flat 10% buff to bosses and vehicles. The reason why I don't recommend Wolverine Play is now it requires 10 sword hits to get the maximum damage. Miners and major enemies will die way before you max out the stacks, while on bosses you can definitely see the benefit of the perk. But if you stop damaging for 3 seconds or guard the sword, the stacks deplete completely. Using Crown Splitter over the Lament also opens up an exotic slot. Austere Strigger, Le Monarch, Divinity, Wither Horde, Arbalest are all great choices. Let's now put in the last piece for the puzzle, the Almighty Exotic Stronghold. This pair of gauntlets have an insanely high skill ceiling in that you can use a huge amount of enemy attacks to heal yourself. Oftentimes, from about to die to full health in an instant, we can break the exotic down into two parts. First, it maximizes guard stats on equipped swords. Second, shots block immediately after guarding heals you. Let's talk about the stats first. With the exotic on, you can guard with a sword and block incoming damage indefinitely until you die, and you won't lose any sword energy. The sword resistance is dependent on the sword archetype, so even with maxed out guard stats, different swords still block different amounts of damage. 
Crown Splitter being the most resistant sword. Damage resistance works as the following. A, B, C, D, and F are your resistance sources, like 90% DR from Crown Splitter and Stronghold, 40% DR from Max Resilience, another 40% DR from Whisper Chains, 15% from each of your resist mods. If you have more damage resistance sources, just add that into the equation. With the resist sources mentioned, we get a 97.4% damage reduction. I want you to keep an eye on the artifact mod called Passive Guard. It gives a 50% damage reduction when holding a sword near some enemies. If we add that in, we get a whopping 98.7% damage reduction when guarding with Crown Splitter, and 87% when standing next to some enemies with any sword out, doing nothing. The second part of the exotic is truly phenomenal. It's one of the most broken mechanics in the entire game. With some practice, you can absolutely bully bosses and practically have infinite health. Of course, I'm talking about perfect cards. We should first understand how this mechanic works. When you block incoming damage within a second or so, you'll heal based on the amount of damage you took. The lower your health, the more you heal. The more damage you take, the more you heal. The exotic does have a cooldown in between blocks, which I'll talk about soon. To effectively use Stronghold's healing mechanic, we should understand how the enemy attack pattern works. The enemies in this game can be separated into categories. I will not be covering every single enemy in this game, but rather common attack patterns that we need to understand in order to know how to use the guardian mechanic of Stronghold. So starting with number 1, Minor Melee Enemies. These typically are red bar enemies that will chase you down and only have melee attacks. Cabal War Beasts, Fallen Wretch, and High Thralls are some examples. Because these are minor enemies, they typically come in groups, which aren't easy to use perfect guard on. They can be dealt with by using a shot from your blinding geo follow up by a couple of sword swings. But to perfect guard their attacks, hold down the guard button when you see them start attacking. So when a war beast jumps up, hold down the guard button to perfect guard its attack. Number 2, Higher Health Melee Enemies These could be red bar or yellow bar enemies that only deals melee damage, often a lot of damage. Cabal Gladiators and Hive Knights are quite common. You will deal with them the same way as you did with minor melee enemies. Lemin often will miss on mobile enemies like gladiators when they jump. Don't expect using multiple red blood attacks into one red heavy. Sometimes only revved light attacks or one revved light into one revved heavy will be a better choice, and you can perfect guard them the same way as you did with minor melee enemies. Number 3, Melee and Ranged Combined Enemies These could be red bar or yellow bar enemies that use ranged attacks when you are far away, and melees you when you get close. Common ones are Vex Goblins, Fallen Dregs, Cabal Legionaries, and Cabal Centurions. These are typically the ads in an activity that come in groups. Blinding Grenade will blind these enemies, allowing you to move up freely with Lament. The attacks come in pretty constantly most of the time. You simply can't guard and unguard the sword quick enough to take in all of that damage. A common mistake people make when using the Stronghold is to spam guard when facing these types of attacks. It doesn't do much other than relying on RNG to help you heal. Because of the cooldown, you will not be able to take advantage of perfect guard immediately after you've already performed one. And since the attack patterns are consistent, you're risking yourself in taking more damage despite you already heal some. The correct way to do it is guard before the projectile is about to hit you, then move back to cover while holding down guard, then move out of cover to repeat for as long as you need to. Holding down guard will make sure you don't take any extra damage when moving back to cover, as in high-end contents, even minor enemies pack a punch. If you do not have a cover available, use sword swings to move in a different position so the projectile that were initially moving towards you misses, and will able to hold guard again, block the incoming damage to heal. Number 4, Stomp and Range Combined Enemies. These are high health enemies like Hive Ogre and Cabal Colossus. If they can be blinded, use a blinding geo. If not, use stasis to freeze them and move out with Lament. You should only try to perfect guard their stomps. Those have a really generous time window. When you see their body move up right before coming down, hold down the guard button. Taking Cabal Colossus for example, when you see the foot raised up high right before it's about to go into a slam animation, hold down the guard button. If they're in a form of a champion, the same strategy applies, with one exception, unstoppable ogres. The laser beam coming out of their eyes are extremely deadly in high-end PvE, and the slam is much harder to predict. Try to freeze them or stun them before moving up. Number 5, Stomp slash Melee and Ranged Combined Bosses. These are the majority of bosses. Stronghold plays them like a joke. 
When you are up in the face, they will only stomp you, and stomps are Stronghold Time's favorite attack pattern. You will perfect guard them as with stomps from category number 4. When you see the animation is at its peak before going to the slam animation, hold down the guard button. You can effectively control them forever, allowing your teammates to do damage from a safe distance for as long as you need to. You can turn a boss fight from extremely difficult to walk in the park with Stronghold alone. There are bosses where you cannot exclusively apply this tactic. Taking the Light Blade boss for example, even though the boss will melee you when you get close, but after the melee, the boss will start shooting you with the Arc Blasts. Obviously, it cannot perfect guard every single blast. The way to deal with it is really just to eat one or two blasts and perfect guard the next shard to heal back to full. Number 6, Snipers. Common examples are Vex Goblins, Fallen Vandals, and Sworn Raiders. They are typically far away from you. To perfect guard it, look at the glow of their snipers. When you see the light it's its brightest, hold guard. The bullets coming out of the snipers do have travel time. You will have to guard slightly after the light reaches its brightest if the sniper is far away. That will simply come with the experience. Number 7. Vehicles. These include Shriekers, Goliath Tanks, Scorpius, Threshers, Fallen Walkers, Fallen Briggs, and Vex Cyclopses. Fallen Briggs have a stomp mechanic similar to bosses, but once you break its face mask, they will start shooting these giant AOE blasts at you. Vag Cyclops' projectile can be easy to trap, but may not be ideal to perfect guard. Threshers and Shriekers are always in the air. A lot of times the Lament can't reach them. If you're able to, great. If not, use something like a sniper or blind them with the blinding GLs. Goliath tanks in particular are really easy to deal with no matter what difficulty it is. Two Lament combos with one Glacier Quake will kill them even in a Grandmaster Nightfall. For Fallen Walkers, you can use the Burst Lament combo on its face until it dies if there are many enemies around. Glacier Quake also works, but will take a little more to kill than Goliath tanks in higher difficulties. Number 8, the Annoying Ones. This category includes Cabal Phalanxes and Half Wizards. The shield Phalanxes possess is an absolute nightmare, arguably one of the deadliest weapons in the entire game. You will sometimes be killed by the architects when they swing this shield at you. Worst of all, you cannot penetrate the shield, despite the Lament having shield piercing capabilities. To deal with them, use stasis freeze with blinding grenades. The Hive Wizards are annoying because they're slim body and always in the air. The Lament has a terrible tracking issue that the chances of missing your heavy attack in the air is extremely high, and sometimes you'll be sent flying. Only tip that I can give you is that if you're about to fly away, don't use the heavy attack. Number 9, the special ones. This category includes Vex Wyverns and Lucent Hive Light Bearers. Their attacks are wonky and often one shots you in Grandmaster content. For that reason, I wouldn't recommend Perfect Guard their attacks because the risk is too high and you don't give enough compensation for taking that risk. Wyverns are easier to deal with if you have blinding grenades. You can simply shoot blinding grenades after blinding grenades with a couple of man attacks in between to kill them. For Lucent Hive Light Bearers, have Whisper of Chains active before you engage with them. That will keep you from being one shot. You certainly can Perfect Guard these attacks. Focus on the attack animation, guard it when you see the animation is ready to slam onto you. Number 10, Explosive Units. These include Squirrel Screeps, Fallen Shanks, Cabal Backpacks, Hive Curse Thralls, and Vex Fanatics. Against the backpacks from Cabals, there isn't really a way to perfect guard them because 10 times out of 10, they could detonate out of nowhere. If you see these on the ground, don't shoot them. Vex Fanatics will leave a pool of Radioleria on the ground when they die. You can perfect guard them, but the pool of Radioleria may come in trouble, which I'll recommend cleaning them up from a safe distance. The other explosive enemies are quite straightforward to perfect guard. They all have noticeable indicators, like Screed and Cursed Thralls will stretch their arms out when they're about to explode, and that's when you should hold down guard. Fallen Shanks will glow bright when it's about to explode. When you see the light is near the brightest, hold guard.
One last thing I'll mention is environmental damage. These damage you really quickly, often cause panics in a sticky situation. To perfect guard environmental damage, I recommend you practice it on Nessus in the radial area or the fire in the derelict Leviathan. You need to learn the rhythm of the tick damage. Don't expect to perfect guard every tick. Start by holding down your guard button, get a feeling of the rhythm, release your guard button and perfect guard the next tick. If you manage to do that, try to step it up and perfect guard every other tick. If not, try it again. With all of that information, you're probably wondering how to practice using the build. Because quite frankly, it is something you need to get practice to have a grasp on. If you're completely new to this, I recommend you start with general activities. Don't feel like you need to perfect guard everything. Start small by simply not dying. You can practice perfect guards by looking for specific enemies in each of the categories that I mentioned before in different law sectors. With enough experience, I think the best way to be better with a build is to use it in dungeons and nightfalls. More specifically, solo flawless dungeons and solo flawless master nightfalls. In dungeons, you will actively try to manage the ads and really forces you to be good with Stronghold's perfect guard. I recommend Solo Flawless Prophecy because it's not too difficult for dungeon to solo flawless. The Taken Scions multiply quite quickly. Combined with the Taken Knights, you can learn a lot from it. Another dungeon is Pit of Heresy, mainly the Chamber of Suffering and the final boss encounter. It's filled with ads. Again, forces you to actively manage them and practice your skill with Stronghold. While in Master Nightfalls, you encounter all different types of enemies, managing acute burns, champions, bosses, and more. You do not need to start with solo flawless, move up slowly from an easier difficulty, such as from not dying in a team, in hero difficulty, to legend, then master, then solo legend and master, and finally move up to solo flawless. If you're able to do both of these, congratulations, you are now a certified behemoth stronghold player. It's time for you to solo a grandmaster now. Finally, I want to talk about some weaknesses of this build. First and foremost, the Lament, mainly its tracking issue. No matter how good a weapon is, if you can't hit the enemies, nothing's useful. The Lament suffers a lot from missing its attacks. Unless the enemy has a huge hitbox, landing consistent heavy attacks in the air is near impossible for the most of us. In high tier nightfalls, this could waste a lot of your heavy ammo and sometimes cost your life. There isn't really a way to avoid it other than hoping this can be improved by Bungie. If you do have the right way to prevent that, please let me know. I am desperate. Secondly, the build doesn't have great acclearing capabilities. None of your abilities can be used for massive acclearing. In order to do that, you have to rely on something like forbearance with the lament to rev through the enemies. Third, this kind of ties into number two. You do not have great control when enemies are really spread out. None of your weapons or abilities can effectively control a large area on the battlefield, and you can block multiple enemy spawn doors. Don't take risks in killing a higher health target such as a champion if you don't have anything to protect yourself from other enemies. Fourth, because the amount of health you gain is dependent on the damage you take, you're not going to see the potential in lower difficulty content, and tickle damage will almost never be in your favor. The best kind of damage slash attack patterns are high damage and easy to track patterns like stomps. I know I'm not a very interesting person to hear information from, but I hope it's bearable and at the very least useful to watch. If I missed something or made a mistake somewhere, please comment that down below. I'll have a pinned comment on addressing issues if there are any issues, as well as more things that I think you should know to better understand the build. Although, I think this video will be plenty enough for most people. Thank you very much for watching and have a nice one.